welcome to Her Business, where we interview inspiring businesswomen and entrepreneurs. I'm Susie Daphnis of the Australian Business Women's Network. My guest today is Emily Simpson, founder of the Centennial Park Labyrinth Project. In this interview, we look at the labyrinth as a metaphor for a way of doing business, and we look at the qualities that a labyrinth-style business has over the often crazy and unfocused maze-style business. We also look at how the labyrinth principles can bring more peace and focus into your business practice. Enjoy this interview with Emily Simpson. Emily, hi and welcome to Her Business. Hi, Susie. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, pleasure. Nice to be here. I'm really looking forward to today's topic, which is a little unusual for this show, and it's the idea of a labyrinth-type business versus one that is a maze. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, I know you're going to make sense of that for us in a moment. But before we do that, tell us a little bit about your background. Well, I uh, started a business uh, in 1995 called Full Bloom, which was uh, designed to, uh, which was about making beautiful underwear for pregnant women because I had, uh, when I was pregnant, I went to buy a black lace bra and I couldn't find one. And I thought that was needed to be, you know, changed. And uh, so I built this business up. I ran it for 12 years and sold it. And um, since then, I've uh, discovered the labyrinth. And so this has become my focus. It's not really a business, this is a fundraising project, but um, it's certainly become a, a new passion. And um, for those listening, um, you are the founder of the Centennial Park Labyrinth Project, and we're going to talk about that a little later on in today's episode. But start us off, give us the definition of a labyrinth. Well, a labyrinth is just a simple contemplative path, which is used for walking meditation. And for those people who find regular uh, sitting meditation a bit challenging, walking a labyrinth is a really easy way for people to centre and calm themselves, to just quiet the mind, open the heart and synchronise things. Now, on our website alongside this episode, we'll put a couple of graphics so that people um, can identify with the image. It's one that you've probably seen many, many times. You may not have known that it was a labyrinth. Um, Quite often, labyrinths and mazes um, are, are... a subject of confusion, I guess. What's the difference between the two? Well, a maze uh, has several different pathways and lots of dead ends and is designed to get you lost and to create anxiety and confusion. The one you would have you, you would have in your mind was probably one with hedges or walls um, and it's specifically designed to get you lost. It's designed to quite literally amaze you, which is where we get the word from actually. And a labyrinth, on the other hand, has only a single pathway and there are no dead ends so you can't get lost. A maze is an intellectual exercise, and a labyrinth is a spiritual one. Ah, I'm going to come back to that spiritual aspect of a labyrinth, but I just wanted to say I'm scared of mazes like the real ones, <laughs> the hedges. I they remember are. being in England where I had seen quite a few, and I was afraid to go into them because, you know, they're so – I'm not very tall, and they're always much taller than me. And I was like, if I get lost in this thing, no one's ever going to find me. And this was, you know, this <laughs> pre-smartphone days <laughs> a long but that's time ago. exactly right. They're enormously stressful. <laughs> and a labyrinth is the opposite of that. It's uh, you. There are no walls. There are no hedges. You see the whole pattern in front of you and all you're doing is following a path. It's very simple. Well, you may have actually answered the next question, which is how does it work? Well, it's a very um, – that uh, there's a degree of mystery attached to it because you don't really understand why it has such a profound effect. But what I can kind of gather is that because of the very simple action of just putting one foot in front of the other along the path and not having to make any decisions at all – It means that your the logical, rational left brain quietens down a little bit and your intuitive, imaginative right brain opens up, which enables us to literally walk into the bigger picture, walk into the larger context or perspective of whatever it is that we're contemplating. It helps you shift from small, tight, closed, rigid thinking into much more spacious, open, flexible thinking. So the the result is a sense of ease and balance and uh, wholeness. As someone who is not very good at sitting meditation, I imagine (laughs) this, the labyrinth caters to people who need to be on the move, but still be able to access that peace and the right brain. Yeah, exactly. It's a sort of, you know, shortcut way. It's an easier way in uh, for people that, you know, find that 
the thought of a half hour meditation is you know fills you with dread <laughs> but um it's also so it's just an opportunity to slow down to reflect and to choose it helps people choose to respond rather than to react unconsciously to become more aware of what's going on for them to work out what you need to let go of what you need to keep and what needs to be added to align with your core values you mentioned a little earlier about the spiritual aspect of a labyrinth is it a, a new age kind of concept oh no it's a, it's an ancient concept walking the labyrinth is actually an ancient practice it's been used in many different countries and many different cultural contexts as a path of insight and self-reflection for over 4,000 years, actually. There are Neolithic petroglyphs which show the labyrinth. The ancient Romans had uh, labyrinth mosaic floors. Um, The ancient Greeks had the labyrinth imprinted on on their currency, on the back of their coins. Um, So it's a and there are oh there are examples from uh, in China ancient ones from in China and India and North and South America so it's a truly universal symbol and um, so it's a, a, a truly non-denominational sacred space and uh, most religious traditions include some form of walking pilgrimage um, and uh, here in this country the Aborigines have you know their return to country which is their form of pilgrimage and um, and they follow the song lines and in a way the labyrinth is a sort of highly stylized western song line um, which invites people to share a common experience reconciling the interests of a, a diverse community what I was fascinated by when we started to speak about having you here on the show today was the idea that people's businesses can operate either like a labyrinth or like a maze and those businesses look very, very different. Yeah. Well, a business that operates like a maze would tend to be very competitive with everyone trying to be the smartest, the fastest, trying to outwit each other. Um, It would have an adversarial kind of atmosphere based on the concept of scarcity where the ends justify the means. So you end up with a working environment that feels like sort of eat or be eaten. And remember that a maze is designed to get you lost. So in a working environment, it would be you would feel like the game is being played with rules you don't really understand. You'd have a, a quite limited perspective, uh, not being able to see the whole game. So you'd feel like a very a small cog in a very big machine. Um, in a maze, you can't see what's around the corner. So that leads to a lot of confusion and anxiety, mm. and people feeling a little bit lost in the you know in the the giant structure. Um, in a maze, there are walls or hedges, which means that you feel kind of trapped once you begin. You have to think your way out. Um, so it creates a very unforgiving environment, uh, w- which is a sort of left-brained, fear-based structure where people feel like they can't really ask for help because it might jeopardise their position. Um, a, a, a business that's run like a maze would have be filled with, you know, amazing, inverted um, in quotes, amazing people uh, pursuing their own individual agendas rather than uh, teamwork. How then, conversely, would a labyrinth uh, business look? Well, a business that operates like a labyrinth would um, have no dead ends. You'd have a sense of steady progress, just putting one foot in front of the other. It would have a a more collaborative atmosphere, not a competitive one. There's no need for people to come first because you're working as a team. Um, The uh, values and direction of the business would be clear and transparent and easy to understand. Uh, the individual journeys within it would be acknowledged without judgment um, because everyone has a different way. As I, so when I'm uh, facilitating labyrinth walks, I always say to people, there's no wrong way to walk a labyrinth. Everyone has their own way to contribute to the team and uh, to contribute their own creative, you know, their, their own perspective. Um, so individual creativity would be welcomed in that team to enhance the process, not kind of frowned upon or laughed at. Um a labyrinth-like business would feel like a more holistic game, you know, like a computer game where you can see the whole landscape and close up simultaneously. Well, that would be almost like, you know, knowing what the vision of the organisation is. 
Yes, but yeah. but but that being embodied in everybody in the organisation, everybody understanding it clearly. So it's not just the head honchos who have this grand vision, <laughs> and yeah. everyone else just kind of drags along behind it. Um, everyone would be participating in that vision, literally, um, in a labyrinth like business. Um, you would feel that you were able to navigate your path with much less effort and less stress because you'd be very clear on what you were doing and what you were aiming for. Um, and whereas in a maze, your mind is on high alert and highly anxious, in a labyrinth, you're much more able to just go with the flow and feel your way into the task or into the uh, whatever the project you're working on. Um, with a labyrinth, you feel able to trust that everything is set up to support you and guide you and that you will all end up in the right place together. <laughs> so you'd have you'd have confidence in the organisation and in the people that are running it that they are holding that space for you to flourish in. Mm. Um, the, in a labyrinth there are no walls or traps so you can ask for help literally or step off at any time um, and then step back on when you feel ready. Uh, in a labyrinth, there'd be a more a mentality of abundance um, where there's a sense that there's more than enough to go around and you have all the resources you need to flourish. Um, so there's more of a, there's an awareness of the uh, connectedness of all things and that your contribution and your impact and uh, your contribution will impact everyone else in the team and all the customers and everyone else that you interact with. Um, so that uh, kind of encourages a, a policy of do no harm, um, and a labyrinth-like business would have would feel like an interdependent community of individuals who are all working harmoniously towards an agreed goal. Mm. I, I, can, I can just breathe easier <laughs> when you're yeah, talking yeah. about the labyrinth <laughs> than when you're talking about the maze. I think I've had a maze kind of morning. <laughs> <laughs> um, the actual labyrinth, you mentioned that you do labyrinth walks. Is, yeah. uh, is the installation of a labyrinth something that you know businesses have done or could do? Oh, some do, certainly. There's, um, I mean, there's been a revival of interest in the labyrinth in the last 10 or 15 years, um, uh, particularly in the United States where – there's been more than 200 labyrinths built in hospitals alone. Um, the, even the Bethesda Naval Hospital, which is a, a rehabilitation uh, hospital for veterans in near Washington, uh, they introduced a labyrinth. They built a labyrinth there last year, and it's helping them work with uh, post-traumatic stress disorder in the veterans. Mm. Um, they're also being built in schools and used very successfully with uh, children with attention deficit disorder because it helps them calm and focus before they attend a task and they're able to concentrate for longer. They're being used for all sorts of different um, uh, ceremonial purposes. Uh, for, people get married in the labyrinth. Um, oh. Last year I did a, a living wake actually for a, a very dear friend who was dying and it was an extraordinary, um, it was a beautiful uh, sit, uh, event because it meant that her friends could gather around her and acknowledge the situation without words just by walking in silence together, it was, um, it was tremendously beautiful and it meant that she was also able to receive the love of her community in a way that she could handle without everybody gushing all over her. Mm. That, and it was tremendous. But in a business context, there's certainly a lot of businesses who do have labyrinths in them and it, they put them in to, you know, to create a space to relax, relieve stress, to encourage creativity and uh, deeper thinking and uh, support problem solving and um, create a sense of connectedness to a higher purpose. And people are realising that that's actually an important service to provide as a business to the it's employee. It's the sort of thing I can imagine the Apple campus having. Oh, I bet they do. I bet they do. <laughs> and you. Google and all these. <laughs> yeah. They know what works. And um, there's actually there's a wonderful book by Daniel Pink called A Whole New Mind. Um, and uh, in that he talks about that the business world is moving from the information age to a conceptual age and um, that we're no longer trapped in the maze of those fear-driven mice in the book Who Moved My Cheese. <laughs> uh, and uh, he says the more appropriate metaphor for our times is a labyrinth and uh, that there's a calling for a return 
to right brand capacities in business. And he lists the uh, the six essential right brand aptitudes, he calls them, which are design, story, symphony, empathy, play, and meaning. And uh, in his uh, I'd, his and the way he illustrates uh, meaning as a right brain aptitude is uh, using the labyrinths um, because he sees it as an easy and effective way to activate right brain capacities. So it might, would be a great way for a business to help help teams uh, uh, work together. And that's Daniel Pink's book, A Whole New Mind, and we'll put a link to that in our show notes. Um, Now, assuming I don't have any space to put an actual labyrinth, um, how (laughs) else can I bring that that feeling into my business? Well, there are are desktop labyrinths available, which are just little plastic or wooden ones um, that have the same impact. It's it's called a finger labyrinth, and you just walk it with your fingers. Um, There's also a wonderful app uh, on uh, for the iPhone called um, iPause, and that has five or six labyrinths on it, and you just move it with your fingers. And so it's just a way of centering and calming yourself at your desk or on the bus or that's that's great. <laughs> that's really good fun. I think also, you know, just revisiting, you know, um, the list of okay, is this am I in a maze way of being right now, or am I in a labyrinth way of being? Is my business looking more like a maze today, or like a labyrinth? I think that just having the awareness uh, of, and the ability to compare will mm-hmm. benefit those listening if they put that into practice. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a nice thing to think about anyway. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about the Centennial Park project because this is very exciting. Oh, yeah, it is. It's really exciting because Sydney doesn't have any public labyrinths um, here. And uh, I um, I first walked a labyrinth a couple of years ago at the Grace Cathedral in San Francisco and I walked it and walked it and came back the next day. I walked it some more and I just fell in love with it, fell in love with the whole idea of walking meditation and the labyrinth as a tool for spiritual practice. And when I came back to Sydney and realised there were none here, I thought, oh, something's got to change. <laughs> so I put together a proposal and uh, took it to the board of uh, Centennial Park and they approved it a few months ago. And so we're just beginning our fundraising campaign to uh, have a labyrinth built. Are you there? Yes, yes, I'm right here. Oh, sorry. So I heard it. Sorry, darling. <laughs> Should I go back? Uh, yes. I heard okay. it beep and I thought it's, I That's thought all right. What happened off. is I just put a text message into your oh. Skype. Okay. Okay. That's all right. Sorry. All right. Let's start so. again. Uh, I'll just ask the question again. Um, so I'll say, tell us about the Centennial Park Project because that sounds fantastic. Oh, thanks. Yes, it's very exciting. Um, well, I, I first walked to Labyrinth a couple of years ago at the Grace Cathedral in San Francisco and I just fell in love with it. And I came back to Sydney and realised there were no labyrinths here to walk. And um, so I put in a proposal to the Centennial Park Board of Trustees to see if they would uh, let us build one there. And um, and they approved it several months ago. And so now I'm beginning the fundraising campaign uh, to get a labyrinth built there. So I'm very excited. Do you have a sense of what sort of time frame we'd be looking at? Oh, well, we're hoping to get it built um, uh, for early next year. Next year, uh, 2013 is their Centennial Park's 125th anniversary. Oh. And I think they'd like it done for then. So I've got to raise the money pretty soon. That's that's <laughs> not too far away. And no. it'll be such a wonderful addition to the park. I'm often there yeah. on a Sunday morning. Um, yeah. And oh, it'll just be terrific. Well, we would love to um, help you realise that goal as quickly as possible. So we'll be sure to let people know how they can uh, donate. So they can do that on a website, I suspect, or somewhere online. Yeah, it's at uh, sydneylabyrinth.org. But you might need to go through a link on your site because... Not many people can spell labyrinth. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. We'll do that. Um, on the Australian Business Women's Network website, yep. we will put a direct link uh, to <laughs> – yes, it is one of those words that I, there's a, a couple of I-sounding things and it's not a common word, but we'll make it no. easy for people. <laughs> <laughs> Emily, thank you so much for enlightening certainly me on uh, another way to – you know, when we want to get centred or present or just be more productive, that there's yeah. tools that perhaps we don't know about. Um, anything you would like to – to leave us with 
Oh, just um, come try the labyrinth. I do, um, if you're in Sydney, I do monthly labyrinth walks at the uh, Mossman Art Gallery. You can find details about it on the website. And uh, come and experience it firsthand because it's hard to, it's actually hard to describe it. You need to feel it and walk it and then you'll get it. Great. Thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure. Thanks, Susie. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed this interview with Emily Simpson. You can learn more about the new Centennial Park Labyrinth Project and make a donation at www.sydneylabyrinth.org. I'm Susie Daphnis of the Australian Business Women's Network, a national provider of education and training for businesswomen. If you're ready to be connected to inspiring women who are making a difference to the business landscape, ask us today about our membership programs. And for more interviews with inspiring women, visit our website, www.abn.org.au.